right. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. It's um, uh, great to work with you and appreciate uh, everything you've done to help prepare this. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and so we are here at the uh, Startup Ecosystem Outreach for Government workshop. Um, and uh, again, my name is Rich Malloy. I'm with a consultancy called Established. And what we hope to accomplish today is to work together to uh, help you understand the, uh, the startup's perspective of, of working with government, building trust with startup communities, expanding your reach across startup ecosystems, and the best practices for translating requirements to the commercial world. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I would like to actually learn, we all from the established team would like to learn about you. And so we're going to uh, post a poll right now to, so that we know what is your organization's experience with startup innovation programs. Do you have a formal program in place that is, is fairly well developed, has been around, uh, or are you in, uh, currently in development of a program or have a very early on program? Um, would you like to develop a startup program? Uh, or what is a startup? Uh, so, you know, share with us uh, what your expertise is. When, when I do um, uh, talks and panels in person, um, I always start with a straw poll because I want to learn about you all first. So while you're filling that out, let's, uh, let's meet the established team. Jen, you want to jump in? Sure. Sorry, the poll just popped up in front of me. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Jen Consalvo and I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of this team, this uh, company called Established. And what we're, what we're really doing is focused on helping organizations with their innovation and startup and uh, communication strategies. That really stemmed from over a decade of working directly with startups and startup ecosystems. So we spun this into an organization specifically focused on that, where we work with organizations like the Air Force and AFWERKS, um, NASA ITAC, uh, airlines, banks, you name it. So we love to dig in. We've been doing this for a long time and really connecting organizations uh, with the startup world and helping them better understand just the whole landscape. Great to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Uh, my name is Rich Malloy. I'm the VP of Engagement and uh, at here at Established. Uh, my first career was in finance, second was in sales, and startups are my third career. And my job is, uh, I primarily manage AFWERKS, but I also help out on a lot of different fronts with the, um, uh, with the startup efforts. Jackie, would you like to and I'm Jackie Dietrich. I build and execute partnership programs for established, uh, both for our own programs and also for our clients. We're a contractor uh, on contract with AFWERKS right now to support the ecosystem development of AFWERKS and the Air Force. Awesome. So thanks everybody again for taking the time to be here. We appreciate the, your, uh, we appreciate that, you know, you've got a busy schedule. Um, so we hope that we can, we can learn a lot. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check on the, check a box on the poll, please do so right now. We just want to know about your level of expertise. Uh, it's interesting. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty across the board right now. Um, so as we dive in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in and get started here. We'll run, maybe Kathy run the poll for another minute or so. Um, you know, there's a lot of great information out there about the pace of innovation. These are two of my favorite charts from a, uh, from a Barclays report is a really, really great report. Um, but, um, you know, the pace of, of technology and the pace of change is just absolutely has been accelerating um, for decades, for years, for centuries, really. And in that sort of innovation is, is increasingly shifting uh, towards the private sector and some of the changes that are happening along there that are uh, affecting our lives on a regular basis. Um, and by the way, I'll just add here down at the bottom of the screen here um, is, uh, and Jackie posted this in chat, afworks.us slash fusion. Um, if you'd like access to some of our resources, including the slide, um, you can pop in there anytime you want. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is a startup, right? Uh, startup Genome defines it as a technology-enabled business that is less than 10 years old. Steve Blank defines it as a temporary organization in search of a repeatable and scalable business model. I personally love the Steve Blank definition, uh, repeatable and scalable being two important pieces. To me, um, a... Uh, you know, a repeatable business is an ice cream shop, 
uh, but a scalable business is a, you know, is a technology business. Uh, and so that you can take that business model and figure it out and then repeat it and scale it. And there's another definition that I like that is actually what is a, once you figure out what your repeatable business model is, your job, your next job is to go out and scale it. Uh, and then those to me are scale ups. Um, so Rich, I have the poll results. Do you want me to share those now? Yeah, please do. Please do share them. Great. Yeah, so we have um, uh, most participants are either in the development or would like to develop uh, a, a, a workshop. And wonderful that we have somebody that has a formal prog um, program already. Uh, when we get into the breakout sessions, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into this and, and it'll be a great opportunity for everybody to bring their expertise to bear. So thank you for, sh for doing that, Kathy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about startup ecosystems. And I love these charts on the right because, you know, you could really overcomplicate this. <laughs> and these, you know, these charts are just hilarious to, 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 to me because it's so hard to define what a startup ecosystem is, right? It's a group of startup genome, again, uh, defines it as a, a group of people, startups and related organizations that work as a system to create and scale new startups. And so this is everything from your investors to your co-working spaces in your coffee shops, your accelerators, your meetups, your service providers and educational institutions and your government entities are part of the startup ecosystem as well. And the whole thing comes together. There's some places that think of this as a very rigid geography, but there's other ways now in our, our, our world today where the rigid geography is not as important. Now, um, it's important to take the startup perspective as we think about building a startup program. And this is the analogy that I always give, PBJ or ramen. Right? Imagine if for every meal, these were your choices. You can choose between PBJ or ramen, breakfast, PBJ or llama, ramen, lunch, dinner, right? And for most startups, hopefully it's not this extreme, but from a business context, this is, your, this is the analogy for the limited resources that a startup has to, uh, to go out and execute and, and build that scalable, repeatable business model. And so if you raise a little bit of capital, would you hire two developers or do you hire a developer and a product person? Do you hire a marketer and a salesperson or do you hire one person that does both? Constantly having to make resource constrained decisions is the life of a startup. In fact, there's a thing called startup runway. And if you're not familiar with it, what, it, what runway refers to in the startup world is when you run out of money. And so while in the corporate world and the government world, when you run out of money is when your budget cycle is over and your budget gets refreshed. When a startup runs out of money is when they close the doors and everybody goes to find other jobs. I've been a part of startups where there were six weeks of cash in the bank and we sat down and talked about who could take, uh, who could take pay cuts and, um, and then, uh, yeah, so of who could take pay cuts and who could go without pay and how we could figure out to stretch the runway from six, from six weeks to six months. This is a great chart because it shows the, the white line shows the, um, the cash in the bank, uh, the blue lines are funding and the red, and the red bars are, uh, are revenue. And you can see in terms like current burn rate, burn rate uh, cash out, uh, and uh, you know what the actual runway is. So very important perspective because not only are you resource constrained, but your dollars constrained and time is your enemy uh, in the startup world. And so, uh, you know, what would a, what would a, um, a presentation be without a Dilbert cartoon? Or maybe I'm showing my age or we're showing our age here, but uh, you know, this is a great one just about the, um, the regs that, uh, you know, that it takes to deal with, um, it takes to deal with the government side of things and how that can feel to the non-government entities. But the important thing is that it's not just the regs, right? These are the common perceptions that startups have about working with the government. There's this massive vendor approval process that I have to go through that I've got to jump through hoops and make all this work and fill out all these forms and do all this documentation. And then there's the contract process and the contract process to get the contract done and get all that, get all that sorted and set up. And so um, that's another process entirely. And then slow to move and make decisions and slow to pay are problems as well, because again, remember the runway, right? If this is your runway 
and you've got a choice between going after a client, going after somebody that can, that can pay you in, in a month after signing a contract and the contract maybe takes three months to set up versus somebody that can pay you in a year and it takes a year to set up a contract. So those are, those are concerns and reasons, published reasons. If you search, if you do a search for why startups shouldn't work with governments, these are the, th the four main things that you'll come up with. So how do we solve this problem, right? Well, I'm sorry, how do you solve this problem? Um, and how has AFWORK solved this problem? And so, uh, and I'll, I'll add a caveat here that established is on contract. We, have, we are eating our own dog food, as the startup saying goes, um, that we are honest. We went through the SIBR process in order to bring more startups on to, to work with AFWORKS through the SIBR model. So we have been through the process. We also work with, uh, with NASA, as Jen mentioned. And so we've been through this process in two different organizations. We understand what it takes. And so we feel like we're in a good position to be able to understand it both from an external piece that can communicate it to the startups and from an internal piece as well. So a couple of key points here for, for AFWORKS, they always start with alignment. And we really admire this about them that um, you know, and this is this came from the base of the future um, documentation, right? Is they want to partner with companies who can seed, can succeed in the commercial base, commercial industry, and then ensure that they have a stepping stone um, to transition, and create clear pathways to add true competitors. And so, uh, all of these are processes that are in place in order to create alignment, and between what AFWORKS needs to fulfill for government regulations and what uh, the um, uh, and what the startups want to to accomplish, in a, with their resource constrained environment. So um, the AFWORKS toolkit is um, uh, there are a couple of key pieces that I want to highlight here, and so we'll so we'll we'll jump into each one of those in a second. All right, the first is the open topic, and the use of the SBIR program enables gives them a framework to create this rapid contracting mechanism. Uh, and the open topic is a way to, to shift the focus of, of the, um, uh, to shift the focus of, uh, of how SIBRs are run, right? To focus on the problem and not on the solution. And so in, in an, in an example of that is a typical government contract will, you know, RFP will say something along the lines of, you know, I need a drone that's this big and does these things and has these flight dimensions and can carry this weight and meets these specifications and has to hit these, these particular requirements. And you get a list of, of 50 different requirements that you have to, to, to hit on, right? That is, um, that's focusing on the, on the solution. Focusing on the problem is I need to see over that hill. And that's the problem. I can't see over that hill, right? What people come up with and what they bring to you will surprise you. And so creating this, this level of openness makes a big difference and will enable people to, um, uh, to, it'll create more competition, create more choices for you, and it'll put the innovations in the hands of the innovator. So next up is the SIBR cycle, right? So tapping into the SBIR. And now, AFWORKS obviously uses a lot of different methodologies to engage with startups. They have the challenges, which we're all a part of here today with Fusion and Base of the Future. Uh, they use STTR, they use SBIR. I'm focusing in on the SBIR piece. It's one of the areas that we spend a lot of our time working on, right? But the advantage here is you create multiple opportunities per year, and that'll come into play on the next slide. You have defined timelines. The budget does not come for the, from the customer, and so the airmen that wants to solve the problem, doesn't have to have budget set aside for this. And while you can tap into things like squadron innovation funds, SIF, which, uh, you know, in other ways, SBIR is there and it's being used and it's being used in certain ways and being used actively. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a uh, lot of opportunity. Kathy, I think we're going to keep going just for a couple more minutes before we do breakouts. Uh, okay. Since there's not a, since there's not a lot of participants right now, I think what we may do is, um, uh, you know, we'll figure out um, uh, maybe have a uh, have a group working session here instead of um, no problem instead of doing multiple breakout rooms. So no problem. We'll get through this, and then we'll take a look at the attendees, and we'll figure it out from there. But thank you yeah. for keeping me on time. Um, so in in the whoops in the previous one, I mentioned the 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 multiple opportunities per year. This is important because it enables you. It enables AFWORKS to be lean. And the lean methodology is build, measure, learn. 
Uh, great book. If you haven't read it, uh, it's a lean startup. It's kind of become gospel for a lot of, uh, for, for, for a lot of the, uh, the, the innovation world. But one of the key things that we really admire about Afrox is their ability to continually iterate and adapt the process each cycle. And they started small and then started working up uh, where they are now at the point where they have thousand, a thousand applications per cycle or more when they had originally just started with getting 30 or 40 applications per cycle. And one of the ways they do that is again, continuing to build, measure and learn, test, try things, this worked, this didn't work. How can we stay within our requirements as a government entity, um, but we'll continue to adapt to meet startups where they're at and understand their constraints. Uh, and then this is kind of a bonus tip here. Um, the, the memorandum of understanding and the way that AFWorks uses that is to create this customer and startup alignment. And so what happens on the back end is that the, uh, is that the contracting office doesn't have to validate whether or not this is a viable product or a viable business or that there's a customer even. So the contracting office can validate that there is a customer because there's an MOU from that customer. And so that customer being an airman that, that wants to implement the solution. So um, that's a nice little, a nice little twist that they've put out there, that they've put in there. Um, we are working, AFWorks and Established together are writing a ecosystem playbook that incorporates these internal pieces and these external pieces. With, and that will be published um, in early fall. Would love to share that with you. Um, if you go to the afworks.us slash fusion, you can... Um, uh, we'll send you a copy when that comes when that comes out. Whew, okay, that was a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have um, uh, so we've got about thirteen participants right now. I think that um, Jackie, I like your suggestion that if we um, I think we could skip the breakouts and actually work as a group here. I'll stop my screen sharing. Um, so we we had planned. Um, actually, I, I will reshare because the, these were the topics that we had planned to share. I had to plan to do breakout sessions on right, understanding startups' perspective on working with the government, building trust with startup communities, expanding your reach across ecosystems, and best practices for translating requirements. And so um, I lost my chat. Where did my chat window go? Sorry, give me one second. Um, so let's, so let's do this at the, at this point. Um, I'm going to share a different document and I'm going to share that with everybody in chat. And so would love to collaborate with everybody together as a group. And I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen as we work on this. And so if you uh, pop into chat and you click on the link there, or, or you could just follow along at, at, uh, uh, on the screen, um, would, uh, I want to actually start by getting a, quick, um, uh, getting a quick feel for what people want to discuss. Uh, and you can put it in chat. You could type it into the document, uh, or you can just um, shout it out because there's, we've got a, a, good, a good crew here, a good small crew here. So what, of these four topics, let's figure out what are the top one or two that we want to really dig in on right now. So we're here for you. Please let us know. You can put a plus one if you want to talk about something in particular. Just a reminder, anyone who wants to shout out a question, just make sure you are not muted. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm uh, Master at Wendy Day. Um, uh, what would be the one thing that you really want people to understand uh, about this today? I think that it would be... Um, you know, on, it would be for, for me, it would be number one, understanding startups perspective on working with the government, right? If, if, you were, if you want to get startups engaged, you have to first understand their perspective and where they're coming from and what is motivating them and how to meet them where they're at. That would be mine. Jackie, Jen, well, what do you think? Um, and maybe even to back up and ask, you know, do people have questions about why, why it's helpful to work with startups? 
you know, if there's anyone who, who sort of has that question in the back of their mind, like, okay, I'm seeing what you're saying, but why should we work with them if there are these, you know, small, potentially unstable organizations, right? We can also uh, discuss that if that's a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Andres, and I am an, a program manager with the Air Force. And one of the things that we I've personally been running through is number two, building trust with startup communities. And as you may or may not know, there there's different types of money within the government, right? So I have different R&D, I have different procurement. So the other part is we're talking about cyber. So one of the challenges that we've had specifically are with data rights. So how can we better connect with the startup community to understand what data rights are? Not only for our benefit, meaning the government, but also to help the companies protect their own data rights. Because that is a big thing as we're investing in these companies, a lot of it, time is not just to buy something, is to buy something that is not necessarily disposable that is going to be maintained and if you've seen the history of acquisition systems in the past two three decades we don't just buy things to dispose of them like we do with our phones so a radio or a computer that i buy in the government lasts me two to three times longer than a personal device and when it comes down to data rights it is a big issue specifically for cyber where the rights are now 20 years. So having those conversations, it's sometimes difficult with the startups in order to gain that trust and better define those proposals, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is not, um, this is not, definitely not my area of expertise and I've actually not come across this uh, um, yet. Um, you know, when, we had talked to a uh, we had talked to an attorney that was comfortable or sorry not an attorney we had talked to a former contracting officer who was comfortable reviewing government contracts to help advise us as we were looking at the contracts and that was one of the things that did come up but it wasn't something that we were really digging in on. Jackie or Jen, do you have um, uh, thoughts on that um, that you've seen? So. You know, for me, it comes down to whether the topic is data rights or anything else, trying to, you know, connect the dots between government needs and expects and what a startup needs and expects is, it's all kind of the same thing, right? You have to understand where they're coming from and you have to speak their language and break it down in ways that they can understand. Um, and I know that we, we see the same types of things on the NASA side and I'm sure every, um, across the DOD. So, you know, while I don't have anything explicit around data rights, what I would say is you have to find a way, I'm sorry, my dogs were quiet this entire day and <laughs> wait until this moment <laughs> to pipe up. Um, I would say just, you know, and Jackie's like a, a ninja at this, is really figuring out what is the language that they understand, what are the concerns on both sides, and starting to create the right documentation um, the right explanations, all of those pieces that make that conversation easier. Does that make sense? So, you know, part of what AFRIX has been doing is that, you know, they actually are going back and figuring out what, what's the language that's not resonating or how do we change this? How do we make this work for everybody? So that's where I would, that's the avenue I would go down. That's great. I'll, and we'll take this as a, as a to-do, uh, Andreas, if you, uh, feel free to email me rich at est.us um, or pop into that form there, the Afrox Fusion. Um, I think it was, uh, there we go. Thanks, Jackie. Um, feel, so feel free to email me and I'll, um, I'll, I'll hunt down somebody for you to talk to about this because building that, building that trust is, uh, uh, is very important. Um, you know, would love to get, as we're talking about building trust, what have, would love to hear from somebody that has, has, uh, has tried something. What have you tried? Um, what have you learned uh, along those uh, uh, along those lines? 
feel free to type right into the document or unmute yourself. Uh, everybody is muted right now, so feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. And I can this conversation a little bit. You know, one of the um, one of the things that we have seen is communication and feedback loops and success stories. And so, um, you know, having consistent communication and uh, being able to, you know, utilize in the public affairs office has been, has been wonderful. The PA office has been an amazing ally throughout this process because we're so used to being able to just tell the stories the way that we need or want to tell the stories. And uh, we need to make sure that we are telling the stories in a way that is compliant with um, how the government works. But at the same time, you have to tell the stories. Startups live and breathe and thrive. I mean, we all do on, on storytelling. And so knowing who those successes are and being able to amplify the work that they, that they have done into their communities is, is a, uh, it, uh, has been a big piece for us. Rich, I would add one of the exciting things that's happened with AFWorks is that the team has really thought in the working with the acquisition teams and what that contracting process looks like, that it goes beyond what they can change about the programs itself, but also doing events like Fusion, where it helps to build trust by creating more of the uh, shared value systems with the startup community, where they're you know, discussing openly what the kind of challenges are and what, um, you know, what they're thinking about in terms of national defense in the future and helping to really lay that groundwork where startups and the innovation economy um, and the ecosystem can really understand how to engage in helping to meet those challenges and goals. Mm. And so it's like these shared experiences that are where a shared value system, and then that opens the more of those uh, connecting points or the pathways to be able to talk about things like data rights and some of those, you know, kind of down in the weeds details uh, with startups and understanding if we have a shared value system for why this is important, then there's a lot more motivation to find working w ways around that. And that has certainly been uh, one of the most exciting things that I've seen from just looking high level at what AFWorks has accomplished in the last couple of years. Yeah, well said, well said. Uh, I saw a plus one on the best practices for translating requirements to the commercial world. Would love to hear from, uh, um, you know, from who is interested in that. What have you tried? Where are you stuck on? What have you learned? What do you wonder? And if you're t talking, you're muted. You can also type in chat. Um, but I'll give you two of the pieces that, you know, that 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 we do, um, and so. You know, one is a book uh, called Value Proposition Design. Absolutely love this book. Um, this is a little bit more from, uh, from the startup perspective, but from an internal perspective, a very simple problem statement Mad Lib is blank needs blank in order to blank. Airman needs a solution in order to see over the hill. All right. Um, an another big thing to avoid is to, you know, is you need to remove all acronyms. Let's see, let's test my spelling and see if I can spell acronyms. Nope, spell check had to, had to help me out there. Um, and so removing all acronyms is a is also a very critical part. Um, you know, defining the problem statement should be should be as broad as possible, and you should be able to uh, you know open it up as widely as possible because somebody may have an idea for your solution, and you know, it, that you hadn't thought of, and they may come at it from an angle that you hadn't thought of. But somebody that's out in this world, <clears throat> focusing on these solving problems every single day can bring a fresh perspective to that. And so this is, this is one of the, uh, um, you know, one of the ways to do that. Another thing that we do with AFWorks is that we actually work with the airmen um, to help to develop those problem statements. And so we go through this exercise to, um, uh, understand what the problem is, what they're trying to solve, and take them out of again, take them out of that solution mindset and put them into the problem mindset, so that it can it can open that up, and then work on our side to match them with the startups from our from our network and from our ecosystem. What have you seen? So for the people that have programs in place right now, you know, what have you would love to hear from you about what you're seeing out there 
as far as the startup's perspective on working with you? You know, when we were doing, uh, when we were doing um, customer discovery, uh, one of the, for our phase one, one of the things that came up was you have lots and lots of meetings followed by, you know, lots and lots of meetings and then nothing followed by a big, huge wave. And that sort of a timeline just didn't work. And so uh, it does, just doesn't work for startups. And again, leads to that slow mover, slow payer, uh, you know, complex process that, um, that perception that is out there. Um, and so helping to break that down is how quickly can you, uh, you know, what is the contracting mechanism that you're employing? How quickly can you move startups through that process? Um, how easy can you make it for them? Um, what are the tools you can provide for them to be able to understand it quickly and easily? And then, um, uh, you know, and then being able to turn that around and get, and get payments done. Jackie, I'd love to, to hear your take as well on top cover, which I know is an important piece. Part of the AFWorks, uh, um, what do I want to say? The evolution of AFWorks has certainly um, hinged around leadership that is very committed to, you know, supporting innovation as one of the strategic imperatives for the organization itself. When you're dealing with the individuals inside that are managing the programs and understanding how they're thinking about their approach and how they're doing business, they get the sense that you know the top cover, the the leadership of the organization is really committed to creating a culture of innovation and to supporting what happens. Um, but they're also responsible for bringing along all of these you know existing systems that enable them to invest in innovation and to engage with ecosystems in the private sector around startups and kind of creating, you know, they've created these uh, models around small, medium, and big bets to really be able to get at that. Uh, and so we meet a lot of individuals that are in this, uh, what was previously called the frozen middle. And I think they're doing amazing work to redefine what the working in the middle looks like, but they're always managing up to think about what stories and how do they make the concept of innovation and culture very real to top level. And the those become part of like the mythology that's building around creating this culture of innovation. But then are also really, really always thinking about at the airman level, what problems are they really trying to solve? And how can their work you know, make a direct impact and have a really clear link to solving a real problem that they're dealing with on a daily basis? And so a lot of the AFWorks um, lessons learned come from how you're constantly managing up to really be able to communicate what the needs are and creating really actionable response to that, but in a way that allows them to maintain agility and to have this culture of, uh, you know, experiment with experimentation and trying to really, um, you know, constantly uh, adapting new projects rather than thinking about it as creating, you know, long lasting capabilities that don't necessarily reflect how the dynamic of innovation changes over time. So that concept around thinking about what's the communication and the needs at the top level to get behind it, while that uh, opens up a broader aperture for what airmen's, how airmen's problems get solved, and that that can look like a lot of different things um, from each cycle of investment. Awesome. Cool. Jen, what would you, what, what um, uh, I like, what would you like to add in here? <laughs> sure. So as Jackie was talking, it just re also reminded me of from the perspective of the startup, um, the just knowing that you have internal champions, uh, someone who's sort of looking out for you, keeps you in mind uh, in some way. So as an organization, creating opportunities um, to build champions, right, for people to become the champions and to know how they can go about um, finding the paths to help these companies, you know, knowing that there is an important end game, right? This isn't just about helping companies. This is about solving real problems. But a lot of times you can't do that without somebody on the inside who really is so determined to make it happen. 
Um, and I've seen that again, not just with AFRIX, but in other organizations where, you know, I, I saw that within NASA, seeing specific people within a field center, like a chief technologist, decide this is this could have saved us, you know, eighty million dollars if we would have had this technology. And no one quite understands that yet, but I am going to make sure that is understood, and I'm going to help make this happen. And you know, and now we're seeing something that you know this this was just a startup is going to the space station, um, for testing. And those things don't happen without those champions. So, just bringing it around to how do you create an environment um, that allows for that to happen. Mm. Um, and that then comes down to the trust, and having that trust, having that champion, having that success story, retelling that success story over and over again so that people know that <clears throat> there are champions that want and that there's, there's top cover and there are champions and they want to work with you. Right. And sometimes that's an investment. So just to be able to be able to get those stories, collect those, tell the stories, communicate it in the right way, being within your organization, a, tr a translator, right? We talked about that earlier and just being able to, to understand this is what my organization, the way they need to hear it, the language that we speak, applied to, you know, what we're seeing this organization can do. Yep. Hey, Jen, building on that, my name is Dave Sweet, and I work as a mentor with a number of small companies and so forth. And I'd like to turn the translation thing that you mentioned that that's implied in the fourth comment there, uh, the other way around for AFWorks. When I listen to a number of the startup companies, who come from the commercial world, they often can't make the translation from the Air Force asking for base of the future or agility prime uh, advanced air mobility kinds of things uh, and understand what they're doing in the commercial world, hearing the right question answer. Let me illustrate with a specific. In base of the future, in the commercial world for airlines, airports, et cetera, they think about airport of the future, which has specific things around internet of things, uh, what happens at the airport op center or for vertical flight, how vertiports would operate. The base of the future needs to include those kinds of things. It needs to think about the problem in the language that the small companies work from in the commercial world. And that translation is a two-way translation. Mm -hmm. It's AFWorks reaching out to, to these smaller innovative companies and vice versa, so that I can actually see uh, as an example, a different example than the base of the future, airport of the future, think about a key thing that FAA, NASA, and so forth are thinking about right now, which is how do I start rolling out autonomous vehicles in a safe way, a fundamentally different safe way, and how do I keep that in mind so that safety first maybe translates, for example, to freight first, freight first being how FedEx, UPS, or on Primair would think about how they roll out autonomous operations safely. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we do have to wrap up. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, uh, Bill, for jumping in there uh, and, uh, and sharing. Um, appreciate it. I am going to just share one more, one more thing that if you want to join our, our allied network, you can join us here. Um, at uh, afworks.us slash ally. And if you are interested in getting access to the, the ecosystem playbook slides today, please go to afworks.us slash fusion and uh, we will share it with you there. So once again, on behalf of Established, uh, thank you again, everybody, for your time. You can reach me at rich at est.us or the whole team at afworks at est.us. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank I'll you. leave the chat open just for a few more minutes, just in case anyone wants to copy contact information or websites, but we will be wrapping up in about 30.
30 seconds. And thank you to everyone from Established. That was great. Happy to be here. Okay. I will be ending the meeting. Thanks again. Have Thanks a good day, everyone.